Welcome to Around the Weird. Here's your host, the museum curator of the strange and unusual, Mr. Nothing. Thank you, mysterious voice, and welcome back to Around the Weird, a booktube channel where I talk about all the unusual and out of the ordinary literature that I have found in my travels. Today, I want to talk about a short story because it is Short Story Tuesday. Uh, It's one that has been adapted into a movie, and it is about paranoia and space aliens. I am referring to Who Goes There by John W. Campbell, which was published in 1938. For those who don't know, John W. Campbell was a writer who lived in the 1900s. Uh, He was known primarily for writing science fiction, both in novels form as well as in uh, short stories. He also edited books, and he was um, seen as a very uh, influential editor in his time, often giving other science fiction writers a platform to publish their work, such as Heinlein, who I haven't talked about on this channel yet, um, as well as Asimov and Philip K. Dick and other, other writers of that time. Uh, so even though he's not particularly well known like the others, he did help give a voice to the science fiction writers um, of, of, of his time, which is pretty cool. Um, although uh, many people have noted that he was um, a little too conservative for his own good. And I think um, the story that I'm talking about today gets at like a lot of the, the red panic, red scare kind of paranoia that you saw um, uh, in, in, in a little bit of the science fiction, how people were like scared of communist and atomic science and whatnot. Um, and uh, a lot of people have noted that that was like, it kind of drags down his work a little bit, although I haven't noticed that in the, in the one story that I've read from him. Uh, so very interesting. This is the first story that I've encountered from him. And what's interesting is that, uh, who goes there was actually, um, uh, turned into a movie, three different movies, all about the same idea, which is The Thing from Another World, The Thing, uh, John Carpenter's work, uh, which many people love, including me, as well as Lucas over at The Bits of Lit, although I think he likes it more for Kurt Russell, and who can who can honestly um, hate Kurt Russell, he's a solid actor. And it was also like the, the remake in like 2012, which nobody ever talks about. And honestly, I think it was just made to, um, to further the copyright on the whole thing. Uh, but you know, that's, that's another point entirely. Um, but without further ado, let's talk about who goes there. I will, uh, do a summary of your analysis and we will move on from there. So Who Goes There focuses on McReady and his team of scientists in Antarctica. They are working on, I don't know, some form of of science, testing ice or whatever whatever it is they do, uh, when they discover a ship that crash-landed in Antarctica a while back, uh, as well as an alien, uh, which seems to be a pretty significant find. Uh, But when they take it back to their lab, they all begin to worry about what's going to happen if they unthaw it, if the alien would come back to life and be hostile, uh, if the alien had any germs that would be bad for humanity. Uh, But ultimately, the the doctor in charge of the whole thing just uh, a a way, a lays, a a lays, something about that word. Like he, he just tells everyone not to worry about it and that uh, everything will be fine because it probably won't come back to life, which is, you know, um, the, the most wrong sort of prediction that anyone has ever had. Um, and so, uh, while Conant is his name is studying the alien, uh, he falls asleep. Um, and, uh, apparently there's a creaking herd behind him, which is interesting. And, um, the, he wakes everyone up a short while later and says that the alien has escaped. Uh, and when they are hunting down the alien, they manage to find it. But as they attempt to kill it, they discover that it can shapeshift. 
uh, and turn it turn into other uh, animals or organisms, including um, mimicking the dogs that are found uh, at this the science facility. But they do manage to kill the alien, or so it would seem. However, the team does have their suspicions about whether or not the alien is truly dead because it was shape shifting, and because it took so much energy to kill the the beast. They believe that. Um, the alien was still is still alive in some form or manner imitating various members of the team and they believe that if the alien is successful in killing everyone or getting them to kill everyone uh it'll escape to the world and conquer humanity by imitating everyone and basically um, uh, making sure everything on Earth dies in the process. So they begin testing blood, and it's clear that the tests that the team comes up with aren't that great, that um, the that um, whatever they're doing isn't really helping in finding the alien. And it might just be the case that any test they come up with is just um, something that the alien is is creating in order to um, hide the fact that they're the alien even more, uh, and this only increases paranoia and suspension, uh, uh, paranoia and suspicions. Um, they have to lock away several several members of the team in order to ensure that nobody is actually the alien, including Blair, uh, who has gone crazy at this point, is locked away in a in a cabin. Um, and a man named Kenner, who they later find out has been killed in the process. But they also discovered that Kenner was an alien, and um, uh, because when they when they go to test his body and see what's up, it turns into the alien, which they then kill again. So uh, it's clear that this this alien beast thing is very good at, at hiding the fact that it's a. Uh, that it's an alien, uh, but eventually they uh, they they perform more tests, including sticking a hot poker on blood, and that reveals three other aliens, which they they manage to kill. All kind of the same alien, uh, based on the alien's blood. Uh, so not different aliens, just the same kind of hive mind. I think is what the story is getting at. It's a bit unclear, but then at this point, the three remaining members um, go off to find Blair again, and they discover that he is also, in fact, the alien who has had time to build some equipment um, in an effort to finally escape Antarctica. Um, but as the story ends, we, we note that there, uh, there was a bird that flew by. Did other birds fly by in the process? Was the alien able to imitate that bird and fly off and, and just leave Blair there. Uh, it's a bit unclear, but it, um, the story ends on a very scary note that uh, other other aliens, other things from other worlds could, could be like this in the future. In terms of analysis, there is a little bit to talk about here. Uh, this is actually a novella, and not actually a short story, uh, and you would think there'd be more to talk about given that it's longer than most short stories that I talk about, but it's actually, there's actually not a lot of substance here unfortunately. But there are some themes that uh, John Campbell plays around with. One of them is that man is not ready. The idea that we simply aren't prepared. What exactly aren't we prepared for? Uh, well, to speak literally in this story, um, multiple people note that we're not ready for the foreign germs or whatever talents that um, this this alien might have, that we simply aren't prepared to deal with something from another world because it's so new to us, because uh, it might have adapted in a different way, it might have some sort of characteristics that we can't prepare for. Um, that, that there are many mysteries of space that um, that are just so unfamiliar to us that we wouldn't be able to handle it when they first arose. And this is the first time it's arising, so we don't know how to handle this type of situation. And it, there's also no real good test to reveal this alien, where we've never had to encounter something like this before, so we have no way of testing whether or not this alien is is actually an alien, whether or whether a person is actually a person. And so, uh, in, in that essence, John Campbell is showing you know, this is one of the many mysteries of space, one of the many problems that we're going to have as we move towards the stars. And again, yeah, this story is set against the backdrop backdrop of space and the atomic age. Uh, it's in the night. It's it was written in 1938, 
but uh, man was, you know, looking to the stars at this time, uh, developing more and more science-based stuff. It was clear that we might one day move into space. But John Campbell was presenting an interesting idea, like what if we did that? And in the process, we came up against something like this thing where we wouldn't know how to uh, test for it, wouldn't know how to prevent it from completely decimating populations. And it's a very bleak kind of uh, uh, perspective on the concept of space travel, because you have all these good things, but you also have these, these kind of scary bad things about foreign germs and, and space aliens that are hostile. Another thing worth talking about in this story is the concept of, of paranoia. I think John Campbell really does a good job of building up this paranoia in this story. Like who is really human and who is a space alien that wants to kill and potentially eat the, the, the other humans? And nobody really knows who it is because again, there's no good test for de determining this until maybe the very end. And even we don't know if that test actually works or if it just if it's just the alien deciding to reveal itself at that time. Uh, so everyone is slowly descending into madness. And I like how John Campbell writes this, how initially people are unwary of this alien, and then they move towards like a, a scared, what what can it do? How are we gonna stop it? And then to a straight up, who who is actually an alien? Who is a human? How can I trust you? What are you doing? Why are you hiding? If I turn my back, are you gonna kill me? That's really great, like to see this entire team who probably worked very well together uh, when when things were going great now just just break apart and <laughs> and wonder like who's going to stab them in the back? Um, who is actually the alien? Uh, John Campbell does some really good writing in that regard. Um, and this all brings me to the end of the story, like the where I think uh, John Campbell kind of doesn't intend for it to go that way, but the question there remains, is, is the alien truly dead? Because although they have killed what they believe to be the three hosts, are the three people who are remaining uh, an alien? Is the uh, Was the alien successfully able to transform into a bird and fly off and leave Blair there? That's that's the question that I think is, is posed. Um, I think the movie does a better job of posing that question as you have like two people left at the end of the movie and neither of those two know if the other is an alien and if, if bad things are going to happen when when reinforcements finally show up when when like a helicopter shows up to take someone away like is the alien going to conquer the world there and i think that same element is here in this story because we we've seen what the alien can do and although the three people have have used this test we don't know if that test works as i said as i said before so um, the, the idea of paranoia and you know what comes next is is very layered within this story. And the last thing worth noting about this story is how it feel like one of the the major flaw with this story I feel is that it's mostly build up. Like you're building up the tensions, but you're doing it for something like. 20 to 40 pages. Um, I read it as a PDF, so I don't know how many actual pages there are, but it's mostly built up. Like John Campbell is is setting up the tone for the event, the monster's eventual reveal, and it's way too slow. I feel like John Campbell could have done it a little better because it's it's just mainly everybody paranoid about the alien, and then the alien shows up and they kill it, and that's the end of the story, presumably. Um, so it doesn't feel like there's much payoff in this story. It feels like uh, it's um, John Campbell really only had a good idea of how to set it up and didn't know how to effectively end it or draw the monster. And I, I feel like that's one of the things where the movie actually does a really better job because you see the, the monster running around and tormenting the entire uh, facility uh, before they ultimately decide to blow it up. And I feel like that's a much better pace than what you see in this story. So uh, something that is much better in adaptation than it is in the original version. I don't think it's enough to make it, you know, seem like the worst story or the worst short story or like a bad short story. Just I feel like the pacing could have been a lot better. And I feel like other people might have 
um, appreciate the pace more so than I have here. Anyway, those are my thoughts on Who Goes There by John W. Campbell. A solid short story, but certainly not one of the best that I've read. Um, I do recommend it to you out there if you are a fan of horror movies or horror short stories, science fiction and horror. Uh, you're going to probably enjoy what you read here. Um, I especially recommend this to Lucas over at the Bits of Lit. Uh, I think he's probably already read this, but if he hasn't, you know, here's something uh, for you to supplement your love of the thing in Russell, uh, Kurt Russell. Um, otherwise, if you've read this before, you simply want to comment on something I've said here, uh, do so below. Let's have a discussion about who goes there. Uh, otherwise, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so that more people can find out about this if they don't already know, and that we can all have a great conversation about the movie, uh, which is phenomenal, even if the short story is not. Uh, and until then, I wish you the best of luck and your weird and out-of-this-world travels. Farewell.